and welcome to the seventh webinar in the Center for Global Higher Education series on race, coloniality and global higher education. The series will conclude this Thursday, uh, but today I am delighted that we will be hearing from Leandro Rodriguez Medina on decentralizing epistemic authority beyond the centers of knowledge production. I'm Alice Wancha and I'll be your chair for the webinar. Um, so before I hand over to Leandro, here are some brief housekeeping points to mention. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted online on the CGHE website tomorrow morning. A transcript of the chat function conversation will also be post posted. Please keep yourself muted unless you've been asked to speak or to ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but please do so when asked to invite it to ask a question. We recommend using the speaker view so that you can more clearly see who is talking. To ask a question, um, I'm asking you please to use the chat function and write out the question you used to ask. You can do this at any time uh, during the presentation. It would be fantastic because that would give me um, enough time to process um, what's coming through in the chat and, and think. Um, about um, what to uh, do next, where to go next. At the end of the presentation, um, if your question is selected, then you will be invited to ask it yourself directly. At which point, please um, unmute yourself. Um, please um, switch your video on if you are comfortable to do so. Um, and please state your name and uh, where you are from. I will shortly pass over to Leandro Rodriguez Medina for today's um, seminar. Uh, Leandro is professor at the Department of International Relations and Political Science at Universidad de las Americas Puebla. He is member of the National System of Researchers of the Mexican Council for Science and Technology and the founding editor-in-chief of Tapuya Latin American Science, Technology and Society. Leandro has conducted research and published on the social studies of science and technology, um, with particular focus more recently on the international circulation of knowledge and the relationship between culture and cities. Um, I, I and um, the audience look forward to hearing you talk, Leandro, on decentralizing epistemic authority beyond the centers of knowledge production. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh... Can you hear me well? Very well. Okay. So thank you very, very much for this invitation. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, David, too. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. It's kind of early here in Mexico. It's uh, 8 a.m. Uh, not so early, but early enough. Uh, so sorry if you feel like I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, you know, weird when I talk, but I, I, I will do my best. Uh, today's talk is, uh, is probably a, a little bit too biographical, I would say, at the beginning, uh, in order to arrive at the point I want uh, to discuss uh, a little bit, which is this uh, notion of decentralizing, epistemic decentralizing. So uh, here, the, the, I would like to start where I started you know, 20 years ago, with this kind of basic question as an uh, undergrad student. Uh, so every time I, I, I read a text while I was studying political science in Argentina, I, I asked myself, uh, why can't we think about our society with our own categories? My, my, my feeling uh, was that we read things, very interesting things about uh, modernization, modern societies, industrial society, post-industrial society, and still there was a problem there with the reality around us as a student, you know, the kind of problem that we faced uh, in, in Argentinian politics at that time or at any time, actually. So uh, that was my question for right after I studied political science, uh, moving to a, a master program in epistemology and history of science. So I, I realized that the problem was not exactly in political science or in Argentinian polit political science, but in a, a different level, I would say. The problem was a kind of epistemological problem, if I may. So the, the, the thing is that the problem continues today, more than 20 years from this uh, original question, 
uh, and it's related to uh, the problem of centers and peripheries in knowledge production. I mean, who produce knowledge, uh, what kind of circulation of knowledge is allowed, uh, and what, what uh, possibilities peripheries have for producing their own knowledge and using their own knowledge. So um, I will try to... Okay, sorry, I, I'm moving different part of the day off the screen. Uh, so one of the things I, I, I was devoted to recently was to um, uh, try to understand exactly what is going on in terms of uh, social, Latin American social sciences, in particular sociology and political science, um, through an analysis of, of Scopus database uh, this year, but for, for a period of 20 years, I was trying to see, well, what kind of production uh, in, in Latin American social sciences we, we can find. And of course, I, I will show you very briefly what I found. But th the first very interesting thing is that once you pay attention to uh, articles written by Latin American scholars, you see the Latin American uh, concept as a main concept in the article, which means that almost all articles uh, produced by Latin Americans include Latin America as a keyword in order to um, position themselves and also to give an idea of, of where the, the findings of the research can be applied. So we have this Latin American concept very central here, uh, but we have other concepts which uh, show some sort of clusters I would like to review very briefly with you. We have a, a cluster one in which the topics uh, are democracy and institutions, of course, political party, constitutions, uh, institutional design, and so on. This is a very long tradition of Latin American reflection on democracy, uh, partially because we have several uh, dictatorships uh, throughout history, especially in the 20th century, and also because democracy became the kind of main topic in the late uh, 20th century from the 1980s on, uh, and, and uh, especially the transition to democracy first, and then the quality of democracy in the 90s and the beginning of this year. Then we have a cluster on violence, which is sad, but it's pretty obvious in the last year. Uh, we have a long tradition of political violence, I mean, analysis of political violence, especially in the Southern Cone. But in, from the 1980s, uh, a different sort of understanding of violence emerged because violence was connected with drug cartels and, and, and you know, challenges to the state in order to deal with the monopoly of violence as, as stated by, by Weber. So we have organized crime, paramilitarism here, violence, of course, also pacification, which is an important notion in countries like Colombia and right now also in Mexico. Then we have a third cluster uh, about gender uh, connected with feminism, with also the, the representation of women in mass media and so on, which is increasing with increasing importance uh, it, it's moving to the center I would say in terms of the graph um, and this is also something from the last I would say 10-15 uh, years. Then we have a, a four cluster on topics in which uh, some Latin American countries like Argentina and Chile have become uh, reference I would say not only for the region but probably for the world which is this area called memory truth and justice related to the dictatorship years, the, the recent past, I would say in historic terms, uh, in which the, the connection between what happened with people, what happened with, with uh, the people involved in politics during the, the dictatorship years uh, after the return to the democracy has been the focus of this group of, of research. Uh, labor is another important topic in, in Latin American social sciences. Uh, this is uh, particularly for sociology. Sociology of, of, of labor has been an important topic, especially in countries like Mexico, for example. Then we have uh, another cluster around inequality and development. Uh, it's also important in Latin America because it's connected with the CEPAL, uh, with the, with the uh, 
tradition of reflection on uh, development started in the 60s, 50s, 60s, uh, that led to um, some major theories in the region about uh, how the Latin American development was associated with the uh, the development of the of the first world or the developed countries. Um, so this uh, this connection has uh, translated uh, recently into reflections on inequality, and poverty, and the need for some structural change in in the region. Then we have a, a, uh, another cluster on regional integration. That was an important topic at, at the end of the last century. It's less important now, uh, where integration is some, it's in crisis, I would say. But uh, there is a, a, a reflection on Latin America as a region, regional integration, economic growth, Mercosur, which is one of the, of the main institutional designs around regional integration. Then we have a very powerful cluster on education and pedagogy that is clearly from Brazil and the Freire's tradition of uh, critical pedagogy. And it's, it's very interesting that this is still uh, present in the, in the reflection on Latin American social sciences in, in, in journals, in mainstream journals, I would say. And then we have a very weird cluster, which is phenomenology. Uh, I, I say it's a weird uh, mm, cluster because it shows the bias of the database. So in this case, again, Brazil has a strong presence in, on, on, on this database, and there is a, a kind of long and important tradition of phenomenology. I, I, I wouldn't go here <laughs> at this point, but I can answer more about this later. So the other thing is that uh, the, the, the whole, the, the position of Latin American social sciences in general is is marginal. So I, I, I want to give you some uh, context on that regard. The first one is about collaboration. So the, the, the problem about category is partially related to this phenomenon of collaboration. If you pay attention to this map, you will be able to see that in the case of Latin American collaboration includes North America and Europe, and that's it. There is no collaboration with African countries, with Asian countries, or with Australia and Oceania. So there is no uh, no way to you know to to dialogue with other southern regions if there is no collaboration. In this case, measured by uh, co-authorship. Um, again. The kind of center periphery structure is also a problem within the region, where five countries count for 90% uh, of papers and almost 90% of citations. You have Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, and Argentina. And, and Brazil alone is a, is a huge country uh, in terms, in any terms, you know, in geopolitical terms too. Uh, but in terms of science and technology, Brazil alone accounts for almost 42% of the production of papers and more than 33% of citations. So Brazil itself is, a, is, a, is an important center. However, the, the, the reference or the, the relationship between Brazil and other Latin American countries in, in terms of being an intellectual center, uh, being the country where new ideas uh, start and, and emerge and they circulate throughout the continent, that's not the case. Brazil is not influential at the regional level in the same way that the UK or the US. So the other, the other question that was important for me and, and came recently in one seminar was, well, but where do Latin American scholars publish? Uh, are, are these uh, mainstream journals as important as they seem to be in the discourse? Uh, because there is where the new concept emerged and, and, and the new intellectual trends emerged. So one thing that I found and it's interesting to share with you is that Latin American sociologists publish mostly in Latin American journals. So you have the, the, the table on the left in which you can see this list of journals and the number of, of publication, the number of papers. Uh, and then you can see very easily that uh, Brazilian journals are on top, but then you have some journals in the titles are in Spanish. It means that usually they are published in Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, the, Venezuela. 
Uh, what is very interesting is that in this list, you have only two non-Latin American journals, Latin American Perspectives and World Development. So if you see uh, in terms of, of publication, where are the most important journals for Latin American scholars are Latin American journals. But then if you move to citations, the whole situation changed because Latin American perspectives and world um, developments move on top of the list. Yes, the, public, the paper published by Latin Americans in world development are those that get more cites, uh, citations. And then Estudos Avanzados in, in Brazil, and then Latin American perspectives. So the problem somehow continues here because if you pay attention to the most cited Latin American papers individually, you, you search them and you trace them. Well, this is the, 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 the result. The result is that in order to have an impact, Latin American researchers uh, must publish in US and European journals. So you can see here the most cited um, papers by Latin Americans, and you see a clear, uh, a clear um, phenomenon that most of them are published uh, in uh, non-Latin American journal. So uh, the situation is even worse to some extent because no Latin American journal among the top 100 journals with the most cited Latin American article. You have to go to the 114 uh, place in order to find the first uh, Latin American journal, which is a Revista de Economía Política. It's a, it's a Brazilian uh, it's a Brazilian journal. So this is connected, of course, with the database we use to measure the impact and the production of Latin American scholars. If we uh, focus on web of science, for example, this year, there are only two Latin American journals in sociology, uh, and they are ranked uh, 144 and 146. So they are marginal within this group of journals indexed by Web of Science. So the point here for me, and, and in terms of the conversation today, is that it's evident that Latin American academic cannot do simultaneously publishing in Latin American journal and publishing in WOS. Uh, and if we take into account that in order to impact, they have to publish in this mainstream journal, well, the, 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 the consequence is pretty obvious. There is no incentive to publish in Latin American journals and, of course, in Latin American languages. The situation when you see a more general landscape is, is, is similar. Uh, some, uh, some papers appear in the last 10 or, or so years have shown that Latin American social science production is rather marginal. Uh, instead, in the last uh, years, if you divide this uh, information in, in in two decades, uh, we have witnessed an increase of the European presence in the production of social sciences. And this is, of course, partially explained by uh, what databases are used for analysis, because these databases hardly take into account journals from Latin America or other peripheral regions. So you have here the origins of social science journal in this analysis um, by Motwa, Nathanson, and Chingras. Uh, about the globalization of social science. And you can see in the last decade that they analyzed from 2000 to 2009, you can see the presence of Latin America or African or uh, other non-European or North American journal is rather marginal. In the case of Latin America, it's just 2.8. But that's interesting because it has to do with what Scopus or Web of Science, the main indexes have done, is not necessarily the case with other databases. For example, the database for open access journal uh, has a very, I would say, a interesting presence of, of Latin American journal, almost 20% of Latin American, uh, of uh, journals indexed by open access um, directory are from Latin America, which is interesting because Latin America has a long tradition of open access journal attached to uh, public institutions in the region. And also, if you move to Latindex or Redalic, which are two Latin American uh, databases, well, the presence of Latin American papers are the majority, you know, 80% in Latindex, 85% in Redalic. 
So it's not that there is a, a marginal production per se, but it has to do with the database that you use in order to measure the impact and the production of every region. And this is also clear if you compare, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, and if you move for social, I mean, uh, web of science, Scopus, and local um, um, indexes. So uh, in Africa and in Latin America, if we take the, the, the case of, of web of science, in the case of Africa, you go from 3,700 papers to 20,400 papers, just moving from one database to another. One general global database, uh, or at least that's how it's presented, to the one uh, focused on the region from Africa. And the same happened in Latin America. If you move from uh, Web of Science with 3,700 um, um, papers produced in the, in, the, in the period they are analyzing, uh, which is a paper by Fernanda Beja uh, in current sociology, uh, and you go to Cielo, which is another uh, Latin American database recently uh, acquired by Web of Science, actually, uh, you go from 3,700 papers to 31,000 papers. So taking, into, uh, taking this estimate into account, the visibility of peripheral region, such as Africa or Latin America, would be enabled by indexing in regional indexes. So there is a problem here. What kind of indexes uh, should we use in order to measure the production and the impact of Latin American uh, scholarship? So the, the second part of, of this is, I mean, this is for me the problem. The problem started uh, with this question about uh, where are the categories that we need to understand our own society? Uh, um, and 20 years uh, later, the problem is centers and peripheries of knowledge production and how knowledge circulates and how knowledge is produced. So some answers are, are in terms of of my, my production in the last 15 years, uh, in, in, in the first research I undertook in order to answer some of these questions is, uh, is one that uh, finally became a book uh, in which I analyzed uh, how peripheral academics use in, in Argentina, in particular in, in Argentinian political science, use Northern knowledge to organize their scholarly careers. It's not just using foreign ideas to understand local reality. It's more uh, a, a work. I try to frame the problem in terms of a sociology of work uh, in which uh, the, the foreign knowledge is used to organize a scholarly career. And that's, why, and, and that's connected with the, the context of lack of symbolic and material resources. So the, the most rational thing to do actually for peripheral scholars uh, is to reinforce the asymmetrical character of global knowledge production structure by relying on knowledge from the North in order to organize curriculum, gathering conferences, inviting colleagues, and so on. The reason to accept knowledge from the North, and this, is, this was some, uh, for me, was an important finding, uh, is not necessarily rooted in the value of that knowledge, uh, in the, in the, even in the utility of that, of that knowledge, but in the opportunity that such knowledge open for peripheral scholars. So in this, in this uh, book and in other related uh, papers, I, I developed some concepts like networked fields, subordinated objects, and asymmetrical translation in order to start my, my own framework to understand the circulation of knowledge. Later, I decided to zoom in into one part, to zoom into one particular theory, because I didn't do that in the first research. I, I was dealing with a community, a Latin um, Argentinian political science. But later, I decided to focus on one theory in particular and see how it circulated from Europe to Latin America. So I focus on Lumen's Nicholas Lumen system theory <clears throat> um, produced uh, in, in in Germany uh, during 20, 30 years between the 70s and the late. 90s and uh, how it was appropriated or received in, 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 in Latin America. So in that case, I developed another concept that I, I needed in order to understand this particular process of knowledge circulation, like um, the different kind of boundary work that these scholars, I mean, the Southern scholars were doing in order to receive knowledge from the North, 
uh, and also other concepts that, like comprehensive reading and embodied exegesis that helped me analyze this uh, specific case of knowledge circulation, theoretical knowledge circulation. Uh, but again, uh, after analyzing how these scholars uh, undertake this boundary work to create the space for the knowledge that is coming from the North, I realized that they benefited from the structuring effects of the knowledge coming from the North, again, in the form of what I called previously subordinating options. Um, so, uh, these scholars receive the theory, but they use the theory to transform uh, their own uh, spaces, their own intellectual, but also working spaces. Uh, and, and in order to do that, it was crucial that this knowledge was produced abroad, in particular, it was produced in Western Europe. So, I continue to develop this uh, theory, uh, not theory, but conceptual uh, tools to deal with the circulation of knowledge, but in particular, how Southern uh, uh, scholars appropriate uh, knowledge produced elsewhere. More recently, I, I uh, started to focus on circulation of knowledge uh, because for me, the most interesting dimension of centers and periphery, the structure of center and periphery is actual circulation. I mean, I'm not interested in any sort of of characterization of centers and periphery that uh, trying to explain this as fixed categories. On the other hand, I think they are flexible entities. Uh, whatever we take as a center of global science has changed throughout history. Whatever we take as periphery is changing. A good example of this is probably China right now. But the point is that in any case, since we have always witnessed centers and periphery, in terms of science and, and knowledge in general, the, the interesting thing for me is circulation, how, it, how knowledge circulates in a context of important asymmetries in different regions, even within uh, the periphery between the powerful peripheral countries or institutions and the less powerful actors. So uh, in the last uh, six years, I was um, devoted to explore different dimensions of circulation of knowledge, um, exploring uh, phenomena like the personal bonds in social sciences, internationalization, the, the role of knowledge drivers uh, who articulate public problems with scientific problems in order to uh, create a kind of agenda uh, for, for uh, the, what is thought the main social problem. Also a topology between engaged and strategic networks and, and how they relate to other uh, networks uh, in, in the developed world. I also approach the topic of language and also the open access uh, um, challenge in the, in the in recent years. But, uh, and this is the last part of my presentation today, uh, the concept that I am interested in now are the concept of uh, decentering and decentralizing. So let me, let me finish by, by going to this concept, which are in a very uh, preliminary state, I would say. I, I, Sandra Harding and I have signed a contract with Duke University Press to develop this idea, uh, and the book should be launched next year. Uh, it's an edited volume with colleagues from STS, and, and mainly from STS Anthropology and Sociology. And, and we are exploring these ideas of decentering and, 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 and decentralizing. But before, let me, let me say a few words how I understand centering. Centering refers for me to the emergent consolidation and diffusion of a naturalized idea that whatever is produced in the center should be taken as universal and consequently can be imposed on any other peripheral place. So centering is a, is a process related to ideas. I want to, I want to emphasize this and I can return to this later. Um, centralizing refers to the creation, development, and implementation of infrastructure that allowed for some places to become central nodes in global assemblage. So centering is about creating this kind of prototype or, 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 or you know, this idea that some parts of the assemblage can be universal and the other parts are local. Centralizing refers to the infrastructure dimension. So one is about ideas, the other is about infrastructure. And you may say, okay, in STS, 
this distinction has been almost suppressed, removed from analysis in the last decade. So practices, ideas, uh, values, uh, instrument, it's everything entangled in, in huge assemblages. My point is not to split this up again, but rather to uh, understand that different dimensions uh, of this entanglement can act in different ways and in different time. So for me, we need this kind of infrastructure of ideas, which is, uh, you know, the, the 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 practices and the instruments and the material, the materiality and so on. But we can have both, and at the same time, to understand that they can work at different pace. They can work differently in different moments. We don't have to assume that any process of decentering, for example, is also a process of decentralizing, and that's very important for me because it point exactly to, to, to the issue I would like to address in this new book. Because the centering, which has, is a, is a kind of long tradition right now in, in even in Northern social sciences, uh, the centering has been taking place for, for at least a three or four decades. Uh, the centering requires to avoid considering some actors or ideas or values or technologies or places a central and as the parameter from which everything around them is evaluated. So decentering is again about ideas. When decentering is successful, it prevents one actor from, from performing as the spokesperson for the other without having been so delegated, because of course there is a more democratic uh, approach to decentering in which uh, it, it could be uh, parallel to some sort of democratic decentralization. I, I will return in a minute. So the centering challenges the monopoly on representation while implying the development of central actors to think from the edge. So the centering is something I'm not very interested in. Um, of course, I recognize the impact of the centering uh, thanks to scholarship from uh, feminist scholar, from post-colonial scholars, from uh, critical racial scholar. I mean, there is a whole school of thought that have been crucial for the decentering dimension of this process. But I'm more interested now in this decentralizing. Decentralizing requires the incorporating into assemblages with equal decision-making powers, actors that have been marginalized, ignored, underestimated or eliminated. I mean, under the elimination, it's very difficult to take them into account, but we can return to the idea of their legacy or the traditions or the knowledge that they accumulate. The fact about, uh, or the central idea around decentralizing is epistemic authority. Epistemic authority, which was concentrated for centuries in certain places and groups in a specific institutions and practices, can circulate to the margin. This is a kind of assumption for us. Epistemic authority can circulate to the margin, can be delegated, shared, successfully challenged, or reconfigured. At the same time, given that decentralization does not take actors at the margin to be passive appropriators of transfer authority, the analysis of decentralization, uh, or, 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 sorry, the analysis of decentralizing forces has to think about the actions the strategies, the possibilities and limitations that from the periphery have been articulated in order to acquire full epistemic authority. So decentralization is about the infrastructure that we need to move epistemic authority from the centers to the periphery. For epistemic authority is not, at least for me, an inherent quality of individuals or groups, especially when it refers to complex issues such as social political rights or climate change. For them to acquire material and symbolic processes that ultimately aim to rebalance asymmetrical epistemic power relations must be created, stabilized and extended. So decentralizing requires delegation to actors on the periphery as many epistemic processes as possible. It recognizes the permanent situation and limitation of both those who seize power and those who acquire power. Decentralization is the construction of 
subaltern epistemic standpoint. When I mean construction is the infrastructural conditions for the emergence of subaltern epistemic standpoint. And this is the last slide that I want to share with you. I hope we are on time. Uh, epistemic decentralization, which is the focus of my uh, current research, seeks to complexify heterogeneous assemblages through their expansion, densification, and rearticulation. Shortly, decentralization will give rise to broader, more interconnected networks, especially at the margins, in which power has been redistributed. And I, I, there are many examples I would like to um, approach. And probably I would do that in the question if it's okay for you. Uh, probably one, one uh, topic that I'm uh, very much interested in the last month, I would say, is the idea of cultural restitution and cultural repatriation, which is the transfer of cultural object uh, to the original uh, individual community or, or, or nation uh, owners or producer. Uh, and that, I think that's a, the kind of phenomenon that I'm interested in, how we create the infrastructure or, or, or we transform current infrastructure in order to uh, give epistemic authority to actors in the margin. The other example is for me, the, the journal that I, I was involved uh, from day one, which is Tapuya, Latin American Science, Technology and Society. Because for me, in these four basic points, uh, it, it shows the kind of, of the kind of project that clearly illustrates the possibility of decentralization. Uh, Tapuya is funded by private donors and a public university from the north. At the same time, it's affiliated to professional associations in the north and the south. It's edited by a global publisher, but it's directed by scholars in the south. And all uh, important decisions for Tapuya are made by a group of scholars in Latin America and the, and the selection of people involved in running this journal requires uh, new members to be uh, situated in Latin America. They have to work in Latin America. They don't have to be Latin American by, by, by birth, but they have to be working in Latin America at the moment they are engaged in Tapuya. So for me, Tapuya in this regard is an example of decentralization uh, resources, translated into infrastructure is allowing for uh, voices that were ignored, were underwritten to be part of a larger dialogue, um, more global uh, communication processes that give visibility to scholarship produced in a marginal region. So I will stop here. I will thank you very much for listening to me. And I'm open for questions, comment, criticism, or whatever you want to talk. Thank you very much, Leandro. Um, if you had had a chance or you would have a chance to look at the comments in the chat, um, clearly your presentation has struck a chord with uh, a large proportion of our audience um, and there are very complimentary uh, comments there. I think you've inspired us all to ask um, harder questions and to think very hard about the concepts that we're using. So I am going to now go straight to questions from the audience. Um, and I'll, um, there are one or two questions that I'm going to read to you in a moment, but I will start with a live question um, from a Serap Emil. If you could um, unmute, please, and um, turn on your camera if you feel comfortable doing so. Hi, thank you, Alice. Uh, this is Serap from Turkey, uh, Ankara. Uh, it was a great, uh, actually, uh, presentation, inspiring. Um, I may not have, uh, you know, asked the question right, but uh, I, as you can imagine, uh, similar scenarios, uh, you know, about for Turkey, Turkish, you know, like higher education. Um, and I was just thinking, and you kind of answered that question, thinking how to shift that uh, epistemic community. And I was thinking the interconnectedness of the, you know, the others, the outsiders. I said, I don't know if, if it's the right word, you know, like vocabulary, but marginal regions, but they are also interconnected um, in terms of, um, you know, spreading the ideas. They are own categories, uh, meaning that I'm recently working with this um, as a co-editor in this journal, uh, emerging, you know, like uh, e e -S -S -E -I, and we are publishing on African leadership, uh, education leadership. 
So now that I also, you know, not just, you know, is interesting, but I'm learning, you know, what is happening in either other part of the world. Could this be an answer or could it be one answer to, um, to your, you know, uh, struggle or your question? Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarap. I don't know if I'm mispronouncing your name, right? Thank you very much for your comment. I would like to, to uh, I totally agree with you. And I, I, maybe an example from Tapuy again can, uh, support your comment. Uh, after four years trying hard, but wasn't able to do it, in volume four this year, we will have a cluster, which is the equivalent to our special issue. It's a set of papers thematically related uh, from African colleagues, which is the title is Justifying Gender in Africa, published in a Latin American journal. Uh, for me, it's a uh, it's a fantastic uh, piece of scholarship for many reasons. One is the quality of the paper, uh, but the other thing is precisely where we want to go for our category, whatever our refers to. And I'm more interested, interested in the feedback as Latin Americans that we can receive from African scholars who probably face similar problems in terms of gender and technology them from, I don't know, let me be very politically incorrect, from Sweden or from Denmark, uh, where we can learn a lot. I, I'm not saying that we don't want that kind of dialogue. We actually want. But we, for us, it was very difficult to get African scholars to be in touch with us. Uh, and it required many people, many, you know, uh, many meetings, Zoom meetings, uh, in-person meetings, and so on. Uh, but the point is that after four years, Tapuya will be published um, uh, this cluster. Immediately after that, a new group of scholars from Africa approached us and said, we want to continue this conversation. So in volume six, we will have another cluster from African scholar. And the other thing is we will have a co-published paper with East Asian Science, Technology and Society, which is another journal connected with Tapuya. And we want this paper, this paper will be published at the same time in two journals. And I'm mentioning this because on the one hand, it points to the fact that we as peripheral regions share some problems. The paper is about the, the idea of knowledge irrelevance, which is a clear peripheral uh, problem. But the other thing is that by publishing the same paper in two, uh, in two journals, we are challenging the indexes because it creates a problem for the indexes. They will have to count citations twice. That's really good. <laughs> so this is how we are playing with the rules and hmm. at the same time challenging the rules. And it's connected with some question about what publishers can do. We can do that. The East Asian Science Technology and Society was published for a long time by Duke University Press and it's published now by Taylor and Francis. So once we hear that Taylor and Francis would publish also this journal, we approach the journal editor and we approach our portfolio editor and we said, we want to do that. This is a, an intellectual sort of intervention that we want to do. We want you to back up this decision, not to create obstacle to this decision. And I, I can show you long emails discussing the legal aspect, the ethical aspect, the, the indexation aspect of it, but actually the, the paper will be published next year. So uh, yeah, I think that uh, the infrastructure is the first step. The mm -hmm. second step is actually to creating the bridges with the other regions for that, that are interested in terms of the kind of intellectual idea, the kind of ideas that we can uh, receive. Uh, but if you don't have an infrastructure, which in, in Tapuya case implies using English as a kind of lingua franca, if you don't have this infrastructure, you don't have the possibility of exchanging idea. And for me, that was crucial because that proves that decentralizing is a condition for continuing decentering. If you want more decentering, if you, were, if you want more ideas from the margin, you have to have the infrastructure for those ideas to come from the margin into whatever we call the center, the metropole, the whatever. But thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. This was great. <laughs> Thank you, um, Leandro. Um, and um, 
Uh, thank you for your question as well. Um, with your permission, Landro, I'm tempted to take three questions now. Yeah. Um, and um, um, after that, I will read some questions that uh, from colleagues whose um, uh, audio link um, is not yeah. functioning at the moment. So okay. I'm going to ask uh, the following to ask their questions, please, in order. Glenn uh, Chatelier, um, Anna Lena Ruland, um, and Erato Basia, because I think your question has already been touched upon in the prior conversation. So um, let's start with Glenn, if you don't mind unmuting your um, camera. Uh, thank you. Uh, Leandro, my commendations on a great presentation. Uh, the question that I have is you know the the, the contextualization that has existed do you think that um you know the crew open science and devs right now uh you know to to blur the um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know if it's me or I yes. can't hear well. So Glenn, there seems to be a, 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 a bit of disturbance and we can't hear very well. Um, the question in the chat that Glenn has asked, I'm going to read it out as well while Glenn hopefully yeah. sorts out. Um, maybe if you turn your camera off and just leave your audio. Right. Um, so the question was, do you see um, the possibility and scope of open science as one vehicle of cross contextualizing knowledge within um, the Latin American knowledge sector? Okay. Um, and I think um, Glenn's link has disappeared now. So please uh, signal in the chat, Glenn, if uh, you would like to come back on. I am going to um, move next to Anna Lena. Hi, yes. Uh, thanks so much, Leandro, first for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, uh, could you maybe elaborate on how um, scholars based um, or from the global north can contribute to the decentralization of knowledge production? Um, in your presentation, you touched on this, you spoke about the epistemic authority and how you can bestow that on actors from the global south, but you know, as a a younger PhD researcher, I would maybe like to get some hands-on tips from you. That would be great. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And um, the third question from Erato. Uh, yes, I, I'm, I don't know if you can hear me or see me. Thanks so much, Leandro, uh, for your um, uh, really interesting talk. I have to say that I work uh, for Outlets Taylor and Francis, and it's a pity that we don't work together on, on the journal, but you never know. Uh, the question I, uh, I have for you is, you, you, you've talk, you have talked about uh, the publisher and what you are trying to do uh, with the co-authored paper. Um, it's a broader question, really, just to get um, some more uh, tips and feedback on, on how uh, global academic uh, publishers can further support um, epistemic decentralization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Landa. Okay, thank you very much for, for your question. I'm, I, I'm sure I will disappoint you <laughs> because uh, I will start by saying that uh, my, perhaps because of my background in STS, I think case by case, every single thing. So every time I have to give some tips or, or, or make some comment that somehow are generalizations, I'm afraid that whatever I say, it will be, uh, you know, it will be wrong actually for some cases or for some past experience or for some future actions. So I, 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 I would like to uh, answer this question based on my own experience uh, more than in my uh, idea of decentralization. We pretend to actually gather or, or give an umbrella concept to understand many, many practices that are actually happening, uh, but maybe are not, uh, conceptualized in this way. And, and perhaps they are uh, not conceptualized in this way. They are seen as not part of a more general trend 
uh, into the, the, the decentralization of epistemic authority. So I will start by what can scholars from the North do, which is, uh, which is a very interesting question. And I, I will take the opportunity to, to, to describe what we do in Tapuya. Uh, one thing that we do as a policy in Tapuya is that every paper we receive goes to uh, a scholar from Latin America and scholar from other parts of the world. Uh, that's a policy. So it doesn't matter if the, if the paper is uh, by a UK scholar talking about Australian higher education. It goes to one Latin American scholar and it goes to probably a UK scholar, Australian scholar or so. So one thing that a scholar from the North can do is engage in publications in the South. And it's not just being part of the board because the board is something like you accept, you know, and probably you do nothing for two or three years after you are renewed in your position. I'm, I'm talking about suggesting special issues, translating words from English into other languages if the journal is in, in other languages, um, reviewing papers, that kind of, I would say, common ordinary task of the scholars in the North but with Southern infrastructure. So engaging in Southern infrastructure in the same way, I'm not asking for more. I'm asking exactly for the same things. Um, that's one step. Uh, the, the second thing is the kind of, as peer reviewers, we ask scholars to bring their own traditions to the discussion in the recognition that this is a tradition. So if you are reviewing a paper about Latin American technology in Brazil for, I don't know, water supply, uh, the second thing that is important for us is that you have to understand that your knowledge is situated as a Northern scholar. Any comment you make, any suggestion you make should be based on that assumption. So that's another thing that is, maybe it's not big deal and you see, and maybe you say, oh, okay, that's, that's obvious. Believe me, it's not obvious. Perhaps for new generations of scholars in the North, this is obvious and I'm happy to hear that. But for older generations, it's not obvious. So they are the guardians of generalizations. They are the guardians of knowledge and whatever comes from Latin America in this case, which is the case I know more, um, it's just a case. And you need to compare and you need to take into account whatever happens in New York or in London. And, so the other thing is a kind of reflexive attitude from, uh, of Northern scholars about their own scholarship, to situate their own scholarship. That would be a fantastic contribution from Northern scholars. Uh, the third point, and I, I, again, I will be politically incorrect, is to keep the standards. Tapuya was created with many journals from the North as a, as a goal, I would say final goal. We think that the North has done fantastic things. Uh, many journals are, are the finest example of academic scholarship. We are okay with that. We are happy with that. So another thing that Northern scholar has to do is just not patronize whatever is coming from the South. So it's, it's difficult. Probably you start to see that it's a tension between being supportive, being situated, and being the kind of, of, I don't know, pushing force in, in, in terms of the quality of the work, uh, because it would be very, very uh, dishonest for me to say that um, the Northern experience about knowledge production in terms of their institution, their universities, their journals, their professional association is something that is not important and people from the South should change uh, all together. That's not my position on that. We should learn and you have to help us what to repeat, what to improve and what to change. And this is a dialogue, not, it's, a, it's not for me replacing one way of knowledge production by a new one, which is based on whatever, you know, I, I have no idea what is the Southern perspective on that. I, and I'm not sure there is a Southern perspective on knowledge production. I have to be very honest on that. Um, I will move to publishers. Um, I, I think that we have been very, very uh, fortunate with Taylor and Francis and the people in Taylor and Francis that is dealing with, are dealing with Tapuya. 
Paul Lynch and, and, and Justin uh, Robinson at Oxford, uh, in Oxford, sorry, in, in the Oxford office of St. John Francis. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, some, uh, a couple of years ago, I asked them to have the opportunity for, for authors in Chapuya to publish the abstract in three different languages, Portuguese, Spanish, and English. Taylor and Francis publishes 2,500 journals. They didn't have the, 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 the infrastructure for that. So I said to them, well, you know, if you want to publish Tapuya, you have to help us. I mean, we need that. So they have to change the system for the 2,500 journals to the possibility of publishing two, three, or more after. Uh, second thing we do, we get waivers. I mean, we have APC, which is a very complex topic, and I'm happy to talk about that. But we have APC. APC is author uh, or article, it depends, <laughs> article uh, processing charge, or, or yeah, the different uh, things in different places. Uh, but author has to pay. That's, that's the idea. So we have an agreement with Taylor and Francis. Uh, unfunded research does not pay. Coming from the North, PhD students usually, coming from the South, even senior scholars who have no funding. So we have waivers, at least 20 waivers per year. That's half of the production of Tapuya a year. So we have waivers that guarantee that we can publish research that is not funded and is not uh, having money for, for the APC. Uh, in order to guarantee that, we have to go to other Northern institutions like UCLA and private donors. So it's a network in which I'm trying always to move resources in order to translate that into other things, you know, waivers with waivers, visibility with visibility, the possibility of uh, co-authorships in the in the future with other people. I mean, I'm 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 committed to that kind of translation. I I like very much actor network theory. I must confess, I'm, I'm very much interested in the kind of translation that is necessary for uh, for knowledge circulation. Actually, and the other thing that publishers can do is to open up spaces for these experiments, as I mentioned, with other journals. We want to publish. Uh, the same paper in two journals, and now we are working in the same cluster or a special issue in two different journals. The idea is that publishers have to understand that, that there are good intellectual reasons to do that. Sometimes, I mean, they are the bad guys, and they know that. Uh, every time I talk with people in Taylor Francis, they know that they are the bad guys. In any conference, in any situation, they, they are the bad guys. And I'm happy with that, and they are happy with that. Uh, so my, my point every time I can, uh, talk with them is to explain that uh, even if they want to be the bad guys, I, I can't change that. Um, they they can do better, and they can give more opportunities to journals to authors. So we are working on the possibility to have this uh, this joint project with other with other journals, and that implies, I mean, it's, it's easier if it's the same publisher two journals of the same publisher. But we are uh, now facing the problem of two, um, um, with, with, with two different publishers. And Taylor and Francis was happy with that. And they were willing to engage in the conversation with the other publisher in order to guarantee that that, that it ha can happen. So again, I think that's an illustration, I would say, of the kind of things that publisher can, can do. But you have to force them. I mean, uh, scholars have to, push a little bit harder sometimes, not just to accept that, okay, this is the system. For example, give me another example. We are a journal published in English. So when we receive a paper in English, many times it's not good enough in terms of the language. But if you return as a rejection, a paper because of language, that's something that I don't want to do. I mean, if, I, if, if the language is a problem that does not allow me to focus on the idea, it's a different problem. It's not that it's bad. It doesn't have the quality in terms of the language for the peer reviewer or the editor to focus on ideas. So we ask the publisher to include a new category, which is incomplete paper. So when we send the incomplete paper, it means that, and we explicitly say, just use Word, just use any automatic software, free software, 
in order to uh, check language. And we are willing to deal with a you know, uh, revised version of this. But we wanted to make a distinction between incomplete paper and a rejected paper, because they are not the same. Again, maybe it's too little for all of you, but uh, for someone who was involved in, in, in creating a journal and with this kind of background that I mentioned in the presentation in terms of circulation of knowledge centers and peripheries, asymmetries and so on, this is the most thing that we expect to become good practices in the future and the publisher understand that they are dealing with more complex phenomena that they thought they were dealing with. Uh, and finally, I, I'm taking too much to answer any questions, sorry. Open access, I have, I mean, I'm involved in some sort of discussion about open access, not open science. Uh, I supervise a thesis by a graduate student here in Mexico about open science and I realized it's a huge issue, opening methods, opening peer review, opening everything, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy about opening because opening is another name for decentralization actually for me. So I'm happy with that, but I'm not an expert on open science and I want to be clear about that. I'm committed from Tapuya with open access. It's an open access journal from day one. It will be, that's why the plan S and other regulations around open access didn't affect Tapuya because it was created with the open access uh, policy from day one, but open access does not imply free. So as an editor in chief, I've been involved in getting money from the north for guarantee the open access policy of Tapuya. It's not something that you can guarantee now and, uh, and for, you know, for the entire future, but I, I'm very happy to say that so far, so good. Thank you very much for your questions and for your answers. I'm afraid time has flown, so we won't have time to um, ask the, the remaining questions live. Although I did promise to Yulia Gataulina, who can't turn on her mic, that I would read the question out, which is, uh, how has the analysis of concept occurrence in the Latin American scholarship been performed? How did you choose your database and what specific software did you use to trace occurrence? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, Alice. So how have you analyzed the, um, the frequency, the occurrence of concepts um, in the Latin American scholarship? Uh, scholarship, okay. and you know, what software did okay. you use for that? Um, so um, I will give you a, a moment to answer that question, but I will just share uh, some of the other questions that have been asked for the benefit of, of everyone before we finish. Um, so we have uh, Pierce's question about how language affects the circulation of knowledge. Uh, we have um, Romina Miorelli's question about how do regional databases measure impact um, uh, and how that and whether that is measured in Latin America. So these are the more technical questions that I picked from, from the chat and I'm afraid I'm going to leave out um, uh, Ron Barnett's question on ecologies of knowledge and David Mills's question on disrupting the logics of the global citation indexes for, for a follow-up conversation. Okay. So if you don't mind very briefly addressing some of the technical questions and then it will work. I will do it, yeah. Uh, but I, I would like to share my email with everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to continue the conversation. I'm writing my email here. I think maybe it's uh, on the website. I, I don't know, but just in case, there it is. I'm happy to continue all this conversation. Uh, very quickly, uh, I use um, Scopus. The period was 2000 to uh, 2020. Um, journals uh, uh, in the category of sociology and political science, which is a category that is handled in that way by Scopus. You can't split sociology and political science journals it's all together. And the, the concepts are uh, concept in the, the, the information I show today is information about keywords, keywords in papers published by uh, papers published by Latin Americans as corresponding authors. That creates a bias, of course, because many times Latin Americans are not the corresponding authors. Uh, but I, 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 I had to be sure that I was dealing with a paper that at least had one Latin American. And the only way to do that, according to the database, is using the corresponding author as, as the category. So I use that, I use Scopus, uh, the 2000 to 2020, keywords, 
uh, and uh, Latin American as corresponding author. About um, um, impact of uh, local or regional databases. Well, I mean, a database is created by measure uh, to, to measure exactly the same kind of impact that Web of Science and, and Scopus, which is citation. I mean, uh, if you want to measure impact in a different way, probably a, a database is not the, the, the main instrument or the most important instrument. You should use another sort of, uh, of instrument. I'm, I'm thinking here about alt metrics and downloads and, and other things that can uh, point to different audiences beyond the academic audience. So uh, most um, databases were created to measure uh, not impact, but production and local production. And uh, you have Redalic, Latindex, Cielo. Cielo was Brazilian, but was bought by uh, Clarivate. So it's part of Web of Science. Uh, and the idea that uh, many of them are actually business and, and some of them are run by scholars uh, affiliated to public universities like, like Redalic. Uh, and that create many, many problems. I share uh, conferences with uh, one of the director and creator of, of Redalic, and he's always talking about the problems they face in terms of money and resources, infrastructure to, uh, to deal with the, the increasing number of uh, journals that they, um, that, that they index. And so uh, I would say that uh, they use the same uh, metrics that traditional um, uh, traditional that databases. They are trying to uh, to look for uh, the impact in terms of citations in other academic uh, journals. Uh, finally, the topic of language is a very complex one. I would say, I, I, can I can I share the screen one minute and I will show you something that I would I would like to show you. We need uh, to be very brief, just because uh, colleagues are moving on to other activities now. Okay, just just one minute. Let me. I want to show you something because I, I think otherwise it's, it's difficult to see uh, or to understand what I, what I think about language without this example. Let me. Can you see this? What I'm doing yeah. here? Yeah. I'm in a. I'm in a one uh, H. HTML version of, of a paper in Tapuya. I uh, selected one paragraph, and as soon as I did this, uh, let me go back, I can translate the paragraph into all these languages. Mm. So I will translate it into Spanish uh, here. So this is a translation of the paragraph. Of course, it's not a professional translation. It's uh, powered by artificial intelligence. And of course, it's uh, paid by Taylor and Francis, not by Tapuya in any, in any case. So let me stop sharing and going to the, to the answer. Uh, language is a huge barrier for circulation of knowledge, one of the most important ones um, on the one hand. On the other hand, I'm very optimistic about the power of some tools to deal with this barrier in particular. Uh, this opportunity to translate one paragraph uh, is uh, something that appeared two years ago. Of course, Taylor and Francis paying for this system for all their journals. And it's something that individual journals, especially in the periphery, can't afford. So that's another reason to go with a, a global publisher at this point. Maybe in the future we have free tools to do this and we don't need Taylor and Francis. They know that I think so. But uh, at this point, they are helping me, they are helping Tapuya to reach a wider audience uh, through this tool that they install for every journal that they publish. I, I, I'm very, very optimistic in this regard. I wasn't, I wasn't. A couple of years ago, I wasn't. I am very optimistic about this. I think that in the near future, uh, readers will read in their language, reviewers will review in their language, authors will write in their language, at least in the social sciences, at least with the commitment to deal with a kind of global English or global language. Um, but I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy to be part of this moment. Uh, I, I, I'm not 
uh, I'm not sure when this will happen. I'm not sure how it will challenge knowledge production, but I'm sure that it's a contribution to um, overcome this particular problem, which is a problem, I want to insist. It's a big problem, uh, language, especially in the social sciences. Um, it's a big problem, but we have to, to do things to try to find middle ground and technology can help. Thank you very much. I think this is a really good point on which to, to end. And I've seen appreciation for this point and other points as well um, expressed in the, in the chat. Um, this has been a fantastic session. I apologize to colleagues for running over, but I think it was well worth it for the conversation that we've had. I'm aware that there are some conceptual questions that people didn't get a chance to ask yet, and um, Leandro will have access to the chat and be able to, to see them. There's the email that you very generously shared with us as well. So thank you so much, um, uh, Leandro. This has been a great session and I'm extending an invitation to everyone to attend the final and eighth webinar in this series uh, with a panel speaking on Thursday 30th of September on decolonizing curriculum and pedagogy across disciplines and global higher education contexts, a critical synthesis. But for now, uh, goodbye to everyone and thank you very much, Leandro. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.